The theme of this lecture, as Michael so eloquently outlined, is um, that of Christmas and the relationship between Christmas work and organisation, and particularly how it might inform work carried out in a contemporary business school. I commence, or the lecture starts with what I suppose is a fairly straightforward proposition, namely that while the celebration of Christmas has largely been overlooked in the field of work and organisation, it offers a, a possible insight into the relationship between culture, economy and society, something which I think contemporary business schools, particularly social sciences business schools such as Essex, needs to take seriously. I then look to justify this, this, this proposition through the exploration of the economic and cultural characteristics of Christmases, both past, present and to some extent future, concluding with what is a relatively speculative and utopian nod to the ways in which Christmas might yet still offer a source of redemption in an often troubled world. Now, my starting point for all this is the assertion that Christmas, as an economic and cultural phenomena, is brought into, is brought into being through the labour and organisational skills of a global workforce. Furthermore, it is not only an event that is highly organised, it is also one that organises, in that it brings into being certain ritualistic behaviours, dictates particular patterns of income disposal and consumption, and requires specific emotional responses whether we genuinely feel them or not, to particular situations, interactions and activities. Christmas is, therefore, to use the language of critical sociology, if not necessarily rational, then certainly both rationalised and rationalising. So what is it about Christmas that makes it such a powerful economic and cultural force? Can we capture its essence, its ability to exercise such a hold over us in a simple word or phrase? Well, according to my research, yes. Yes, we can. Quite simply, Christmas is magical. So what I am suggesting is that perhaps what makes Christmas so powerful and enduring is what, in critical philosophy, philosophy we might call a negative dialectic. By this, I mean a stable but precarious social state that emerges for an, often from a, a, from a complex of often com contradictory and opposing forces that historically reinforce themselves. So in the terms of Christmas, on the one hand, we have the values of enchantment, of myth, and the, the almost ma magical suppression of time and the everyday order of things, and on the other, the rational art of organisation, planning and control, that makes this suppression possible, but at the same time constantly threaten to undermine or destabilise Christmas's precarious hold on our imagination. But then things changed. The 19th century brought about, as we know, a new era. Some would argue the industrial era of modernity. Well, you could trace it back to earlier than that, of course. But by the 19th century, there was a new social order. And in both the newly industrial worlds of Victorian Britain and the US, there was a need for some new magic. For while industrialization had brought with it many marvels and wonders, it also brought with it many significant problems. The instability of the new capitalist economics and its tendency to produce more than could be consumed combined with the urban poverty and depravity of the great industrial towns and cities, were posing an ever greater threat to the newly established status and security of the Victorian middle classes. Something needed to be done, and in part that something was the magic of Christmas. Indeed, as the likes of the cultural sociologist John Story has argued, in large part this Anglo-American Victorian Christmas was invented first and foremost as a commercial event which sort of throws into relief many of those debates about has Christmas become too commercial? As the 1800s came to an end, therefore, Christmas had settled into a new pattern of behaviours. Its magic was less likely to be found in the myths and practices of old, in the rhythms of nature and the suppression of time, but rather in the organisational and technological products of modernity. One of the things about Christmas I'm trying, to, I'm trying to develop here is that it grew in both cultural and commercial importance in parallel with its increasingly significant position within the popular psyche. Throughout the World Wars, for example, Christmas became an important rallying point for nations on all sides, but most notably in the US. And it was in America, particularly both during the interwar and post-war years of the 1930s and 1950s, that it also became quickly apparent that Christmas could once again be mobilised to help generate growth and employment due to its unparalleled capacity to sell just about any commodity as we see here, from cigarettes, through vacuum cleaners and underwear. Well, I hope it's an advert for underwear. It's either that or a, 
very good party, to even, to even firearms to young children. I didn't use another image. My favourite one that I found was actually just a picture of a revolver, and it said, what do you want for Christmas? I was not quite sure what the message was behind that one. Um, but Christmas, as I said, Christmas became, it became possible to sell anything through Christmas. But this wasn't by any stretch a one-way one process. For what's interesting is, for whatever commerce took from Christmas, it always seemed to give something back, somehow enriching the mythos and magic of the season. For instance, the story of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, now a staple character in the Christmas canon, was originally written into the Christmas script in 1939 by Robert L. May of the American retailer Montgomery Ward. Rudolph was a colouring book character posted out to thousands of homes and companies. He became then obviously um, immortalised in, in the song by Gene Autry. The contemporary image we have of Santa Claus today, while contrary to some urban myths, not produced, sorry, not, not invented by Haddon Sundblom, nonetheless became made globally famous through the man's depiction of the hearty gift giver for Coca-Cola, Coca which was here, this is the image first seen in 1931. Through Christmas, therefore, culture and economy came to interact in such a way that increasingly erased any remaining, remaining distinction between the two. Christmas both, both defined and was defined through its relationship to commerce. Emerging for you sociologists out there as a Durkheimian civic religion, Marxist fetishization and a Weberian re-enchantment all conveniently packaged for annual consumption. It's not just about service and retail, of course. As we know, in most cases, what must be sold as a commodity must first be produced, and increasingly produced elsewhere. Reflecting the global supply chains that constitute the modern Christmas, China in particular manufactures on average 70% of the world's Christmas decorations. With $15 million worth of artificial Christmas trees and $150 million worth of Christmas tree ornaments going to the US alone. At the same time, shopping malls around the world are adorned with decorations that stock both specialist Christmas items as well as targeted luxury goods. Thus, the circuit of production and consumption frequently come full circle. As, for example, I was told of one story of a Chinese retailer who comes to a particularly large department store in London to purchase the Christmas decorations to sell back in China. So here we have, you know, the, the products of their own country, country being taken back. But obviously in that way, developing a premium as they were perceived to transmit the magic of the Anglo-American festivity back to the East. From a business school perspective, I suppose this all sounds very exciting. I, you know, this, this is about a global, a global market, a global industry, generating vast amounts of, of wealth and surplus. But Essex Business School is also concerned with issues of ethics, with issues of sustainability. Um, and these are questions that also may be less palatable, no, but nonetheless important when we consider the question of Christmas. Um, it, perhaps, perhaps not unsurprisingly, of course, it's hard to come by research and data into this dark side of Christmas. After all, nobody wants to be the Scrooge. Nobody wants to be the Grinch. You know, it's amazing how we develop these, or generated these words to, to characterise people who somehow ask some critical questions about Christmas. But nonetheless, it has got a dark side. For as I've already suggested, it's at the interface between the realm of commerce and organisation and the everyday values and practices of people that we might start to pursue some equally interesting questions about how the magic of Christmas is really made and what it might cost. I say, what I've tried to do is, I've tried to just illustrate, rather than make any heavy theoretical argument, but just illustrate what is a relatively straightforward proposition, namely that the magic of Christmas is brought into being through a host of what are extensive and indeed financially intensive economic and organisational practices. Practices that in turn often depend on Christmas in order to ensure their own economic viability and continuation. In this sense, therefore, Christmas can be viewed as a necessary invention of modernity, something if not designed, then certainly orientated towards maintaining the operation of today's economy and society, and as such, a legitimate ob object of business school inquiry. Furthermore, from a critical perspective, this is a magic that transcends the high street and the workplace and which penetrates deep into our homes, our family lives and our personal hopes and aspirations. Even those of us who seek to ignore the festival or for religious or cultural political reasons distance ourselves from it, often find ourselves drawn into its orbit as we define ourselves in opposition to it. Um, I was part drawn into researching Christmas, not simply as a, as a, I think Sam was making this point very well, not just as a critical social sciences academic, but somebody who actually had an interest, 
a fascination with the way in which it mobilised people of a range of beliefs, faiths, practices, backgrounds, um, into doing often things that I felt were positive, that were good. <laughs> 